welcome to the Natural Health Podcast, where we bring awareness of sustainable health in business hustle space. Natural Health Podcast is perfect for the high-performing business-minded individuals who want to work with their biochemistry to achieve success and optimal health. It's Friday, which means it's time for friends sharing facts about health, business, and overall success. In today's episode, we talk to Brittany Frino. She's a personal trainer, business owner, and a body image expert with the mission to help as many women as possible to embrace their bodies, stop feeling guilty about food and enjoy exercise. Over the last seven years, she has been able to transform her life from hating exercise, eating unhealthy, hating her body and having constant guilt over what she's eating to now loving exercise, eating whatever she wants and being so comfortable in her body. She has now created a business based around helping women to achieve the same results, living their best and healthiest lives. Some interesting facts about Brittany is that she absolutely loves dogs and you'll probably hear them in the background (laughs) and she loves baking bread and she is a big true crime fan. Welcome to the Natural Health Podcast, Brittany. Thank you so much for having me. You're most welcome. So tell me about your doggies. I mean, we spoke a little bit. We, ne- we were nearly in tears talking about our dogs just before the podcast started. So we've we've wiped away our tears. We'll put the tissues away and we're ready here now. <laughs> we are. I have um, I have two corgis. Um, so Pembroke Welsh corgis. They're the queen's dogs in case anyone's not sure. Um, so I have a boy who is three um, and also have a little girl. Um, so the boy is Hugo and I have a little girl named Primrose and she is actually Hugo's daughter. Um, so my mum's been breeding dogs for many years and when we got Hugo, she decided that um, corgis were going to be her next breed. She fell in love and um, so, yeah, she started breeding corgis and so I literally got to see Prim come out of the womb and like, yeah, so I've known her since day dot and got to see her little personality develop and it's been really cool and special. So Prim is one now um, and they come running with me and they just, they just live their best lives. I wish I was a dog. Like they just are so privileged, these dogs. <laughs> Primrose and Hugo, and they're definitely yeah. going to be heard on the podcast. We'll definitely hear them barking. They're like, yes, we are here. What a beautiful story <laughs> that, you know, you saw um, the birth of uh, Primrose. I think that's absolutely brilliant. And you've been yeah. there for day dot one. Yeah, it was really special. They actually had to have C-sections because um, corgis can give birth naturally, but um, the puppies were huge. It just turns out Hugo produces really huge babies. <laughs> and <laughs> so the puppies were just bigger than normal size corgi puppies. Um, and so they had to have a C-section. So we were actually in the room um, as, you know, they're over there, like cut open <laughs> And they were bringing the puppies over and because they're like obviously a little bit drugged, um, like from, you know, putting the mother out under anesthetic, we kind of helped to, you know, like wake them up. And um, yeah, so it was just a really, really special experience. I thought I would kind of be grossed out by the whole thing, but um, fortunately the the mum was far enough away that it was just like, you bring the puppies over and we're all helping. And yeah, I got to sit on the back seat with the basket full of puppies on the way home. And um, yeah, it was just really special to be a part of that whole experience and yeah even even now seeing all the other litter mates and stuff who um who gets what traits from what you know parent dog and stuff like that you know it's cool to see what genetics get passed down even though like just random things that you're like they've never learned that because they don't live together but you know they do these same things so it's really cool fascinating absolutely fascinating well thanks for sharing that with us i think that's a beautiful start to the podcast talking about little (laughs) cute puppies and little babies so forth yeah i love it but let's talk about you now let's talk about Brittany. let's 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 talk about the key turning point that got you to where you are now i mean um in the bio we spoke about you know you hating your body hating exercise feeling guilty about food and then turning around and loving these things and loving your body, loving exercise, eating what you want. What have been the key turning points to lead Brittany to where she's now? Yeah. So I guess I've kind of had two. I had my initial turning point, um, which was actually when I was um, kind of in the, in the largest body that I had been in, was not healthy, was not exercising, um, was not feeling great about myself at all. I was so critical. I used to, you know, walk into every room and be like, well, I'm the biggest person here. And so, you know, just like judging every single thing that I did. And um, I remember being on a train heading into the city for work. And, you know, there was lots of people on the train, lots of people standing. Um, and a lady offered me her seat and she was like, oh, do you want to sit here? 
And I realized that she thought that I was pregnant and that's why she was offering me her seat. She didn't say that, but I I knew that that was clear because there was lots of other women standing around me as well. There was no other reason for her to, you know, offer me a seat. And that kind of was my initial trigger. Um, And from there, that's when I, um, I got a mobile personal trainer myself who would come to me because I knew being such an exercise hater, if I had to go anywhere, it just wasn't going to (laughs) happen. I was like, I need someone to come here and just make me do it. Um, And, so after a little while, yeah, we, I lost a, a fair amount of weight. I improved my relationship with food and, um, yeah, it just was, it was eating a lot. Um, and from there, I became a personal trainer. And um, at that point, you know, five or so years ago, I was very focused on, um, I was always very, you know, uh, body positive and like positive self-talk and, you know, focused on balance, never kind of doing any super um, you know, restrictive things. I was always very much like, oh, cool, you had Macca's for dinner, sweet, do you enjoy it? Yep, cool, let's move on. Like never judgmental or anything, but I was still very image focused that, you know, I helped women lose weight and that's what I did. Um, and then a few years ago, I developed hypothyroidism. And uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it basically, um, it's a thyroid condition that slows everything in your body down. So I was just exhausted 24 seven. Um, I could barely walk the dog, um, let alone do a workout. So um, I gained weight throughout that process because um, it just wasn't great. I tried to, you know, restrict my diet a little bit to try and, you know, stop that from happening, but that just made me more tired. And I realized, you know, there has to be a better way. There has to be something more than this. Um, and that's when I really started on my kind of body image journey and, um, you know, learning to love my body for how it was and what I could do rather than, um, what it looked like. And so that's kind of when I started to make that shift, did all the research around practical ways that I could actually improve my body, um, body image, I should say. And um, yeah, kind of that's when I kind of shifted into that body positivity um, or positive body image, I like to call it kind of mindset and helped my clients with that as well. Um, And it's really cool because I've had clients that started with me like before and have kind of come on that journey with me and yeah, so now I'm a much more into more like intuitive eating and um, like I don't kind of, I used to be a big, you know, count your calories person and I'm like, you know, that's really beneficial for some people, but I don't think we really need to be doing it as much as what we do. And yeah, so I kind of really changed up my whole attitude towards health and fitness and made it a lot more holistic as opposed to um, just kind of focusing on image. Yeah. And I mean, we all get these moments in life uh, where scenarios or someone says words or something happens to us where we just get that light bulb moment and we go, wow. And I guess Mm. that moment on the train for you was that light bulb moment and you were like, wow. And and then being diagnosed with hypothyroidism or anything, and the listeners might have been diagnosed with something else or something similar Mm. or even the same as you, it kind of puts like that little like that little, you know, uh, disease or monkey on your shoulder that's always there with you and you're like, oh, yeah. and you're just, you know, sometimes we can just spiral into negativity from it. But it's beautiful to see that you've taken that, both those scenarios and taken it up and gone, you know what, I'm going to do something about this. You know what, I'm not only going to change my life, which you have, I'm also going to change other people's lives around me, which I think is absolutely amazing and beautiful that we take these situations that happen to us and turn it into a positive and that's what you've done yeah yeah and and when I was kind of on my body image journey as well I I started to really notice how many of my clients were still really critical of their bodies even though they might have reached their goal weight or you know whatever their goal might have been and I was like we need to be working so much more on our body image and on our mindset as opposed to on our bodies um I mean Obviously, fitness is fantastic, but, you know, instead of thinking the solution is to always lose weight or change that body part that we're not liking, or we need to work on our mindset um, because you're always going to find something that you don't like unless you you do work on that. And so that really helped to prompt me um, to find ways to help people through that because it is a big challenge and we're always going to have challenges. I mean, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. There's still days when you're like, oh, I feel a bit uncomfortable in that. But then you're like, oh, you know what? Like it's not letting 
that stop you from doing things or letting that kind of derail your day. Um, Because I used to find that a lot, that it would be like, oh, I put on a dress and it doesn't fit anymore. It was a bit tight here or, you know, then that would just derail my whole day or week or something. So it's, it's learning to control those thoughts and focus on the positive. Yeah, and we're going to talk more about that soon. Before Mm. we jump into that, I wanted to know what does success and optimal health look like for you now? I mean, hearing you talk, um, I can kind of get a bit of a gist of what optimal health looks like for you. But what 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 is success to you? What 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 does it mean for Brittany to be successful? Oh well. I feel like it's so varied now. Like it used to be so focused on like, oh, well, I would be successful if I hit a certain weight or whatever. And um, I think, you know, it's so varied for everyone and varied for myself. Like now I measure my success on um, like improving in certain areas of my fitness or um, how many people I've managed to help. Or um, just recently I've, I've been really working through on the business side of, of my business, like trying to educate people around their body image and different ways that they might be struggling with it that they're not thinking of and you know so how many people I can actually help with that and help them to realize things and um so that's definitely a lot more where my success is measured um in how many people I'm helping as opposed to kind of my own self image I suppose like in my own um you know weight loss goals or whatever like it used to be but now it's a lot more okay well I've I've gotten faster running or I could run for longer or um you know those kind of fitness sides or I've not thought about my body this week much or I've only thought positively or you know so changing up those views of success um and they're going to be different for everyone like like you mentioned with optimal health as well you know I would love to be, like, I would say I'm not a natural exerciser (laughs) Um, coming from that hating exercise side. Like, I look at my uh, husband and he's definitely a natural exerciser, you know, like he just, he's a cyclist and um, recently he had a a crash and he he was fine, but um, he had to get his bike fixed. So, he didn't have his bike for a little bit. So, he started running and he gets straight into it and is just like, boom, five minute kilometer splits, like, which is fast, by the way, <laughs> if, you, if you don't know. And I'm just like, you're just so like naturally good at it. And I'm so not. So <laughs> to be able to, <laughs> you know, like I am like. Opposites attract. <laughs> opposites attract. Exactly. And so, you know, having that optimal success of instead of being like, well, I need to be the best at this unless, you know, and, you know, otherwise it's not worth it. Well, just being the fact that, well, I can do it and look at what Mm. my body can achieve um, when I do put the training in um, because like I started running and and this is from you know six years of fitness at this point you know of exercising continually and you know I could run for like a minute and a half and I was like I'm dead like (laughs) you know and so then to be able to build that up and see how that progresses you know focusing on those things for my health especially because Um, When you do have a chronic illness, there is stuff that you can't control. There'll be days when I'm really tired, especially if I've been really busy. You know, it's a lot better now. But, you know, learning that there are things out of your control and to focus on what is in your control and um, try and find positive aspects to have that optimal health um, and success in that area as opposed to just focusing on, yeah, kind of, yeah, as as a whole, especially if you do have those kind of challenges with your health. Yeah, I love your view on optimal health and success. And I love seeing uh, if you reflect on your own journey, the growth of what you've gone yes. through. And I That's guess a great word, growth. <laughs> <laughs> and the audience would also be able to think and go, you know what? If they reflect back, they can go, you know what? I've had some growth too. Yes, I may not mm. have hit that goal weight according to the scales. However, you know, like I can maybe like you run that extra minute or you know what I can actually, or even a success might be to not do anything exercise that's planned because you're listening to your body being like, okay, I have it planned Monday, Tuesday and Friday to run, 
but I only ran Monday and Friday. And that's okay. That is success because on Tuesday, if you ran, you may not have all the other things done, which are a high priority. So exactly. I love, I love, I love the definition of um, optimal health and success. But let's let's get into today's topic, which we've already touched upon. And I love that. It's just naturally flew in. We've already touched upon it. How to ditch the scales and love your body unconditionally. So what is the whole obsession with scales and where did this come from? Because I can just like I know myself, right? Um, there's been, there's been times in my life where I've had scales and I'll jump on them literally every morning. There's been mm. times in my life where I've had scales there and I have not touched them. Right. Um, there's been times where I'll jump on every three months, every so often. Right. But what, I don't know. I, I've, I've seen it in the females. A lot of females jump on the scales and, and lately I've heard a lot of guys do the same thing, but even young individuals jumping on scales because they're then measuring it. But where did this whole obsession come from? Like, give us your input on all this. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, yeah, just recently, like I do have scales in my house and probably a few weeks ago, I was like, oh, maybe I should just get on. And then I was like, no, that that piece of data is not actually going to provide me with any benefit to my day. And, and I think um, where it kind of stems from is when we look at um, health and fitness, we often try to find measurable um pieces of data to, to kind of measure ourselves against. Um, and so that's kind of what, if you've heard of the term diet culture, that's what it's about. It's counting your calories, it's measuring your body, it's measuring, um, you know, your weight, all those kind of things. It's very data-based. And um, that's actually like, especially for women, that's a very masculine way of thinking. And if you think of like, I, again, use my husband as an example, um, you know, of the 50 million diets I tried before I, you know, kind of got on my proper journey, you know, he would just change his dinners because I had changed um, what, what we were having or whatever. And he would lose like five kilos in two weeks because, you know, X equals Y for them. And so that's why data points on a masculine um, perspective or masculine scale is really quite accurate because usually, you know, what's going on in their bodies is a bit more, I suppose, stable um, than women. There's a bit less interfering <laughs> with what can be going on. And so, you know, using those masculine points kind of puts women in a very Kind of almost uncomfortable mind frame. And so we always want to use these scales because that's what we're supposed to measure ourselves against. But again, that's very masculine. And so we're not comfortable with that, especially if we are kind of more on the feminine side. We all have, you know, aspects of, of both in us. But, um, you know, so the feminine side is so much more. How do we feel? How have we progressed in other ways? How has our body um, changed that makes us feel good? Or, you know, kind of a lot more feelings-based as opposed to data-based. But because um, that's all we've ever kind of been taught throughout dieting, throughout you know, you think of every single diet or exercise program or anything, it's always eat this, do this much exercise. You know, it's very um, based on those data points. And so that's why we kind of have become obsessed with it because that's all we've ever known. We've not been taught that we can actually measure our success or, um, yeah, our success by other da like other feelings and things like that that might be more aligned to our views. And so finding those ways to measure those things rather than just thinking about the metrics can be really valuable, um, especially for women and can help us to remove that, um, that kind of fear and reliance on the scales because I'm sure you, you are aware as well for women, you know, you've got, you know, eating less will, you know, you know, eat less, exercise more, and you'll lose weight. But I feel like that's great for, for men. That's often fairly accurate, obviously speaking very um, generalized terms. But for women, I feel like you've got, you know, you've got your X over here and you've got your Y here where you want to get to, but there's lots in the middle that you, <laughs> you need to kind of wade through a lot of other things going on in our bodies that, that can affect that. And often it's how has actually exercising and eating better, how has that made us feel and how has that helped those things in the middle? And that might naturally result in some weight loss if we start to eat better and exercise more, but 
what we really need to be focusing on is how we feel as opposed to just thinking about those, how many Mm. centimetres have we lost, how many calories are we eating, how many workouts are we doing, what does the scale say? Because we might be feeling great and then we jump on the scales and it goes, you've only lost 200 grams. And you're like, well, what was it all for? (laughs) You know, and then you're like, well, I'm useless now, then you revert. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we can go, you know what, I'm feeling great and I'm feeling so much better, I'm fitter, I'm healthier. And we go, well, I, that scale is not actually going to give me any information that's going to benefit me. So it just kind of trying to remove that reliance on the scale mm-hmm. as being our what we view our worth on or how we have the right, like that attitude for the day. Like if that's going to change how we're feeling, if we get on that scale and it hasn't gone down or if it's gone up, is that going to make us feel terrible even though we were feeling good before? Well, it's probably not healthy for you to jump on it then. Yeah, so it's a question that you would ask yourself when you're looking at the scale before you go on a, a question that you can ask yourself is, is it going to benefit me? Uh, yeah. If the result is lower or higher, what is that going to do? And most exactly. of the time it'll be like, oh, I'll rely on it and I'll have a shit day or I'll mm. have an amazing day. But if we rely on something external to us to give us that happiness or to give us that fulfillment, then really is it worth it jumping on there, right? Maybe you should exactly. go and meditate instead. No. <laughs> exactly. Or just like let's like stop and reflect on all the things that have improved since um, since we've started, you know, exercising or eating better or whatever the case may be because, oh, my goodness, the improvements that you get that has nothing to do with your body size is is immense like you have there's so much improvements and then you know you might be like oh feeling really great about all those things and then you jump on and you haven't lost weight and you're like well now I just feel terrible and we forget about all the other things because we've only been taught that this metric is the only one that matters when really especially um for females because we are so much more um kind of you know generically emotional feelings based beings that you know focusing on those how we have improved in other ways is so much more beneficial to our health and our mindset when it comes to being healthy um happy individuals yeah 100 percent. and i love that you said it's uh you know scales is a measurable thing which is also a masculine thing um mm. and, and 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 numbers and measurements and improvements and goal setting and so forth that's all masculine things so we mm. are trying to achieve happiness within a just a masculine environment that's yeah. not going to work and not just for males it's not going to work for males even if it is just masculine mm. the, the I, I believe the balance would be if we put the feminine and the masculine together for both males and females and try and achieve a goal in that way and that's where that balance comes about um yeah, I, I think that's kind of like what you're saying in line with that. And I think it's mm. absolutely key, but it's not something that, you know, we, we're told to do, especially in the diet culture, and especially with the scales, uh, looking at the scales. We're just told to jump on the scales, see what the number was a week ago. And if it's lower than that, that's amazing. And I mean, look, it's been everywhere yeah. around us, like even... Um, we can think here in Australia TV shows like The Biggest Loser. We can think mm. so many other things because that was the key metric. Um, the key metric was once a week jumping on the scales and seeing what that result was. Yeah. Um, so there's so many things around us that could be um, put into that. But Definitely. the other thing that I wanted to jump on is is talk a little bit about why do us women have so much shame and guilt around our bodies? And that's a deep topic. We can talk about that for like hours. I know that. <laughs> we could. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about that for hours. I mean, you know, um, and I know I'm only talking about females here, but this can go for males also. But, you know, having the guilt and the shame, like you said, uh, you used to go in a room and think I'm the biggest person in this room. What are all these things that happen in our head when we compare ourselves and we're just sitting there at a party and we're looking at someone else's thighs and we're like, are their thighs bigger than mine or smaller than mine? You look at yours and you compare or you look at Mm. something else like that person's belly or your belly or when someone's exercises or running at the gym. There seems to be a lot of shame and guilt within us, right? Definitely. Where do you think we've learned this negative body image from? Well, I think a lot of it does does kind of start within childhood. Um, we've got our peers. I mean, um, body size based bullying is the biggest form of bullying that is around at the moment. I saw that that statistic was in an article this morning, and I was like, wow, that's so sad. Um, but so that's a huge 
huge player. Um, also, like not blaming our, like especially for women, our mothers at all. But um, I mean, you know, if you have a parent that is um, criticizing their bodies or constantly dieting or anything like that, again, they didn't know any better and they don't know the effect that it's going to have. But as children, when you see adults criticizing their bodies or other children criticizing their bodies, you go, oh, well, if if they say their tummy's fat, mine's bigger than theirs. What's what's wrong with mine? I thought mine was fine, you know. And I remember going to school. And it's going to sound so funny. I have um, my thumbs are like shorter and wider than they normally are. You know how they call them like toe thumbs or something? I think Megan Fox has them. Um, and well, I that's remember, all right then. If Megan Fox has it, you're fine. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember being young and being like, oh, I have such beautiful hands. I could be a hand model, you know, like seeing the junk mail of the jewellery things and being like, I could do that. And then like going to school and people started picking on me because my thumbs were different. And I was like, what? Like, so it's not until you know, you're not born negatively viewing your body, but when you start to um, kind of associate with people or the people around you, I suppose, start to speak negatively about your body, you learn that, oh, well, my body's not okay and I need to constantly be changing that. And we have, you know, movies, TV, as we grow up, that all is just solidified because you think about even movies now and TV now, I once you start to notice it, it is so so obvious but you know you have women who are of a smaller body who are very attractive and they are seen as desirable they get the main roles and they are kind of good until they're what maybe 35 and then they become the mum and even if they are still super beautiful you know (laughs) like you know so that's kind of the role but if you ever see a woman in a larger body in a movie they're almost always seen as the joke or they're they have to be funny because they couldn't possibly be desirable because they're in a larger body or you know like so we're always so right just thinking about it once you think about it right right. yeah they're always the funny the joker the yeah oh my my gosh yeah wow. so when you actually think about it you're like we're having these beliefs constantly shoved down our throat even subconsciously of well if you're not in a small body you're not desirable you couldn't possibly be attractive or successful you have to be something else because you know you either need to change yourself to fit into that mold or you need to develop a different part of your personality because um yeah so it's and Yeah, like, I mean, I was just watching, like, the James Bond trailer, the new trailer that came out. And, I mean, Daniel Craig's, what, like, 50 at this point? I don't know exactly. Um, But, you know, he's got, like, a tiny 25-year-old woman. I'm like, couldn't we have, like, a, like a size 10 or a 12 woman that's, like, 40? 10, a size 14. (laughs) Yes, a 14, a 16, anything. Like, just something that's not a size 4, you know, (laughs) Um, and not, not saying that we should be shaming those bodies, but like let's 100%. just have some diversity so that, you know, people can start to see that women of all different shapes, sizes, colours, everything can be seen as desirable, successful, happy, content women and they don't need to change themselves to fit into, you know, this size four mould because that's the only thing that could be seen as beautiful. And you know, what sucks is that these women that are, you know, size four, they will still find so many things to criticize about their bodies because it's not about our body size. It's about our mindset. So Mm, mm. um, there's a saying of like, oh, I like seeing real women and things. And I hate that saying because I'm like, all women are real women. Yes. So by saying real women, you're saying that anyone below of what, like a size 12 or 14, shall we say, isn't real. So you're discriminating against mm. all of those people and you're saying that only this is okay. It's like, how about we just try and accept everyone for their size and not just make one acceptable? Let's make a whole range acceptable. Um, and that's what yeah, like that's how we develop this negative body image because, yeah, we have it people talking about it around us and then we have it you know on tv and movies like we're just kind of that's just constantly solidified Mm. that you have to be small to be acceptable and to be desirable and it'll um, be interesting to know if uh rebel wilson she was seen as that funny character right um Mm. and 
It'd be interesting. Now that she's lost the weight, I wonder what roles she'll get. It'll be interesting. Mm. So let, keep an eye out on that. It is. Hey. I am interested because, like, even though she has lost a lot of weight, she would still be classed as a larger woman in Hollywood. So, um, yeah, I'm really curious. And I was actually watching a show recently. It just the second season got released on Netflix, Sweet Magnolias. Have you seen that show come no, up? No, I haven't. No, it's like a, it's based in, like, South Carolina and America and it's just a very, like, wholesome drama and it's based around three women. And one of the women in that show would be a size, maybe like a size 18 to 20, you know, so she's in a larger body and she is, they do not discuss her weight at all. They, she is seen as desirable. She is successful. She has a successful business, successful mother. And I was just watching it and I'm like, yes, like I was just so happy because when you have that realization of, oh my goodness, this is literally the only show or movie I've ever seen a woman in a larger body be depicted as, you know, having love interests and having a successful um, business and successful relationships with people, you know, like it's so refreshing to see. And when you start to notice it, you're like, wow, we don't, we don't see it. And that's just continually solidifying that well, we're not okay if we're if we're in a larger body. I can um, just imagine you emailing the producer and being like, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> oh well done, <laughs> I love you." I know. <laughs> I started like going on about it to my husband, and he's like, "Have you had wine?" I'm like, "Yes, but that's not the point." <laughs> I'm still you don't super understand. Happy about this. I'm going to email yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I love that. I love that you placed a little bit of light on that because. I've never thought about it. Um, I've mm. never actually sit down and actually thought about it. Um, I know that um, what you said is most women, you know, under the age of 35, looking fine, and they're the ones that are going to get the roles. We all know that mm. for ages. Mm. But it's interesting that you pointed the light towards um, individuals not being desirable um, or successful or anything along those mm. lines. That's really, really interesting. So I guess, you know, the shame and the guilt about our body can come from things around us. You've mentioned childhood. Yeah. You've mentioned mothers, fathers, siblings, people around us, close friends. Mm. Uh, you've mentioned, you know, the media, what we're exposed to. And that even in itself mm. is a huge topic. So there's a number of things um, that we need to be aware of that could be responsible for our beliefs about our bodies and that shame mm. and guilt. Um, I've, I've looked at yourself up on Instagram and the things that you do, and I've seen you talk about four signs you're struggling with your body image uh, they may not have thought of. And a lot of individuals may be listening to this and being like, you know, well, I don't really have body image issues that I know of or they just put on the mm. carpet or anything like that. So dig into those, like spill the beans. Yeah. Tell us about these four signs. <laughs> So, yeah, I feel like a lot of people think that they might not have body image issues. Um, And I'm going to say, I would say 98% of women would, (laughs) Um, probably a lot higher um, of men recently than in in past as well. But um, one of the first big signs is um, constantly criticizing our bodies and seeing if they um, kind of analyzing them to see if they meet beauty standards. So uh, we might be, let's take arms, for example. I have a friend who um, she would have smaller arms than me and, you know, gorgeous, t- like this is how I see her. So, you know, gorgeous golden tan skin. And um, she's like, oh, no, I can't wear something sleeveless because it'll show my arms. And um, I'm like, okay, so um, what people think is that they go, okay, well, my arms are a problem, so I need to do weights and I need to lose weight to fix that problem. But really what they're doing is they're struggling with their body image and they need to work on their mindset around why they think that large arms are bad and where that comes from and challenge that belief to see what we're thinking. So that's like a big thing, like people criticize a part of their body and think that that's just normal when really it's a body image issue, but they might be thinking, actually, I just need to lose weight. It's fine. Once I lose weight, that problem will be gone, but it won't be. And, you know, it might be gone for a little while, but eventually you're going to find things to pick about your body again. So if you're constantly picking at your body and wanting to change things on it, that's a big sign that you are struggling with your body image. So that would be like my biggest one. Um, And kind of in conjunction with that, my second one would be having that belief around, oh, well, I can only be beautiful if I shrink my body. So if I'm in a smaller body, if I lose weight, then I'll be beautiful, then I'll be happy. Um, And unfortunately, 
it just, again, it doesn't work that way. We're going to get to that point. You might be happy for a little while and then you'd be like, oh, oh my arm's gotten a little bit flabbier or, um, oh, my tummy's sticking out a little bit or, oh, my thighs still touch, like, because like, um, or like, oh, I still have hip dips or, you know, like I have hip dips and they're not going anywhere. Like it's literally a bone structure, but there are, you know, you know, things on Pinterest out there to show you how to get rid of them and things. It's, it's just always thinking that we need to change that body. So that kind of analyzing our bodies and picking on it and also having that belief that we need to always be smaller. Um, They're two big signs that you're actually struggling with your body image as opposed to thinking like they kind of just think we just need to lose weight. Another big sign is judging yourself and others based on size. Um, So I think of this like... um, I, I, always, I like to use the example of I've got a friend who's in a much smaller body than me. Naturally, she's a lot smaller. If me and her did the exact same exercise routine, the exact same food, and in six months, you know, slept the same, everything exactly the same for six months, we would still have vastly different bodies. And, you know, we often will look at ourselves or look at other people and go, okay, well, they're in a smaller body, so they must be fit and healthy. And they're in a larger body, so they must be unhealthy and never exercise. When I know that we all know people who live in smaller bodies and never exercise and don't eat well, and vice versa, you've got people who are in larger bodies that exercise all the time and eat well, you know, so our bodies are different (laughs) and they will respond differently but if we're judging people or just kind of automatically making those assumptions that a little smaller is healthier then that is also a sign that we're struggling with our body image because we kind of don't have that thought process that you can be larger and you can be healthy Um, so that's another big sign And the last one is criticizing people's actions based on their body size, um, which I think we've probably all been guilty of. I know I have, and it's something I think we always have to work on because again, these things are, we're conditioned to feel this way that smaller is better. And you see it in movies a lot, but like even, um, you know, thinking about like you might be in a food court and you see a small woman eating a, a burger and you're like, yeah, eat the burger. But if you see a larger woman eating a burger, are you like, what are you eating that burger for? You shouldn't you really be having a salad? Like if those are the thoughts that kind of come up or, you know, judging what they do based on their size um, or you like even a smaller woman, you might not have second thoughts about that. But do you see a bigger person eating something um, that you would deem as an unhealthy food or something and go, oh, well, what are they eating that for? Or that's why they're so big. Or, you know, like if you are having those thoughts, that's a sign that you're, you know, struggling with your own self-image and your own beliefs around size because, you know, we always, you know, know that, you know, online bullies, you know, it's more about them than it is about you. And often that's the case when we are judging other people's actions based on their size. Well, really it's about us and what we believe and we need to work on that. Wow, Brittany, you've just like... (laughs) Sorry. Boom. (laughs) Boom. You've got some issues. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Do you have problems? Let me tell you. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. No, I love that. Um, You've put it in such simple terms, four things. And um, unfortunately, uh, you know, being raw and honest here, I hit those marks. Like, you know, Mm. I have in the past judged myself. I've in the past judged other people. Um, And it's really interesting because I used to work in HR and we did a test on, um, we we made our managers do tests on their unconscious biases. Mm. Um, And sometimes they will come across as racial, ageist, um, um, you know, body size and so forth. A lot of managers came back positive in regards to body size. And I Mm. was just gobsmacked, you know, and that shows to us that we have these, unconscious biases for uh, certain types or certain things of people that we believe should be successful if we are working in business or even if we own our own own business, who we are going to hire, we are going to hire uh, who we see as being successful that, you know, you know, the movies, our, our, our life has made us believe who should be successful or believe who mm. should be the right fit for the role. So you talking about those body image, those four things, it's just absolutely crazy. And I can imagine the audience being like, tick, I've done that, tick, I've done that. That It's 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 just crazy and it's just mm. makes you reflect and go, wow, I have some unconscious biases or some unconscious beliefs 
that I've just you've helped us bring up and been like <laughs> maybe we need to do something about this maybe this is yeah. why I judge myself maybe this is why I don't love myself unconditionally maybe this is why I don't accept my body Exactly. And like you said, like these are unconscious feelings often that we come up and things that we're conditioned. Like I don't say these signs to make us feel bad about ourselves because let's be honest, we're already doing that. Yeah, <laughs> we 100%. want to kind of like let's, <laughs> let's bring awareness to it so we can go, okay, well, what's actually the root cause of the problems here? Is it your body size? Is it other people's body size or is it your attitude towards it? And it's so much is about educating ourselves because again, as well, we're taught, you know, we have to be within, you know, like I rant about BMI all the time, but, you know, we're taught, you know, this to this is our healthy weight range and that's all that we can be in. And that is, and same with the scales, like it's such a restrictive measurement. Like all it is taking into account is how much your entire body weighs, like your weight like it's like it's how much food you've had, how much water you've had, how much your hair weighs, how much your boobs weigh, how, you know, like, you know, if you've gone to the toilet that day or not, you know, like so much of that is so irrelevant. And, you know, like so many people, like myself included, I sit in the, depending on which BMI scale you look at, it either calls it overweight or obese. I sit in that range and I'm like, but you wouldn't look at me and go, you're overweight or obese or you know you wouldn't think about you know those kind of things and you know we just we're always kind of try to shove be shoved into this little mold and you know when we go okay well we need to focus on things outside of that because our weight is such a inaccurate measure of our health and mm. when we start to like one of my favorite sayings is you can see size but you can't see health and so yes. when we actually start to, <laughs> it's a good one. Yes. Can um, we say that again? Can we say that we again? We can see size, we can see size, but we can't see health. So you have no idea what that person in that larger body or the person in the smaller body, what their health is. And so we shouldn't be judging people just like we shouldn't be judging ourselves and learning and educating ourselves around size and health and what really matters really helps us to go, wow, my size actually doesn't matter that much in relation to if I'm going to be healthy or not, you know? So um, yeah, not kind of judging and viewing what the real root cause of the issue is, is that we've got those body image issues that we need to work on as opposed to, well, we just need to lose weight or um, that person just shouldn't eat burgers or, you know, like we need to bring it back to ourselves and go, what do I really need to work on? Girl, wow, 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 wow. <laughs> if there's any wow moments, you've jam-packed with these podcast <laughs> wow moments. I'm telling you. Oh, thank you. It's like, it's like honestly, it's like, yes, you are 100% right. Health is not determined by your size. Um, not at all. 100%. So, so body size, right? How does it affect our health? It, it doesn't, does it? It doesn't really. Um, I mean, I've, I've done a bit of research into BMI and um, they talk about, you know, obesity associated illnesses. And again, they are associated, not obesity caused illnesses. <laughs> so we need to remember that as well. It's just associated. And your highest risk factor is if you have a BMI under 18 or over 35. So you've actually got quite a big range you can sit in that is, is not going to put you at a higher risk. But again, you can be in that range and your health can vary hugely. So the most important factors for our health, regardless of our size, is that we exercise regularly, whatever that exercise might be. Like it doesn't have to be rigorous, you know, just moving our bodies, eating enough fruit and vegetables, not only fruit and vegetables, but just getting enough of them, um, not smoking and not drinking to excess. So those, uh, drinking alcohol, obviously. Um, so those four things are actually what's going to be the biggest um, factors in our health as opposed, regardless of what body size you you live in. Like, so you could be at the top end of the, you know, um, you know, BMI range and you're doing all of those things and you could be much healthier than someone who sits in that healthy weight range but does none of those things. You know, you see a lot of smokers live in quite smaller bodies and things like that. That doesn't mean that they're healthy. So we need to stop associating that size mm. and health 
factors because, you know, it really, it doesn't really come into it that much. Um, you know, obviously there are, uh, you know, people that are, you know, morbidly obese and things like that. That's often a lot of psychological, um, you know, challenges that they may be facing that they've got to work through. Um, but yeah, like that's, that's the most important factors is, you know, when you live in a body, you just need to take care of it in a way that's manageable. So yeah, yeah. eating your fruit and veg, exercising, don't smoke, don't yeah. drink alcohol excessively. Um, yeah. And that's what really matters at the end of the day. I love that. I love that you mentioned that. Um, and unfortunately, there are those individuals that you said that it is, you know, I don't even know if the wording is right, morbidly obese. Yeah, it's, but- it's hard to find the right, <laughs> right word. Yeah, the sometimes. right word. And, and most of these individuals, if we do look at them, or if we know them, they are, mo- I'm not, I'm not categorizing completely, but unfortunately, they're not even able to move. So therefore, they're yeah. not exercising, right? Yeah. Um, and there's so many health factors that come with that. So, yes, mm-hmm. we're not completely saying here that your body size completely has absolutely nothing to do with your health. What we're trying to get here is just to say that we need to look at a number of other factors. We need to yes. look in a combination with a lot of yes. other factors that we need to look at. Um, yeah. So, you know, you've spoken about positive body image. What does that even mean? I mean, we're bombarded. We go on Instagram, go on Facebook, we listen to a podcast. Everyone's like, you know what? You should have positive body image. It's the best thing. Positive body image, Mm. this, that. What does that even mean? Uh, It is such a good question. And it's actually something I I talk about in my um, body love program that I have because to me, it has to mean something different to each person because you have body positivity on one end of the spectrum, which um, is basically about loving your body regardless of its flaws, but it also kind of brings in that um, you shouldn't want to change anything. There should be like um, no negative thoughts. You're never allowed to change anything, which I personally, I view a little bit um, unbalanced, but if that's what you identify with, awesome, you know, go for gold. But for me, that is a little bit unbalanced for my personal beliefs. You've then got body neutrality, which is based around um, just basically being neutral. Like it doesn't matter what your body looks like um, kind of attitude, which again, kind of is almost on the other end of the spectrum. And I personally feel like I sit somewhere kind of in the middle. I want to feel um, that I'm not overly concerned about what my body looks like. Um, I'm not overly um, concerned when I might put on an outfit and it doesn't fit or something like that. Those kind of things have stopped worrying me. I can point out lots of positive things about my body. I can focus on my body uh, for what it can do as opposed to what it looks like because a lot of the time we don't have control over what it looks like. So, you know, like um, for me, that's where that sits. But, yeah, in my in my um, program, I actually go, you need to work out what it means for you because if you're trying to strive for someone else's idea of body positivity or positive body image, it's not going to work. It's like, it's like in business, for example, if you were, you know, trying to reach, um, you know, if you were trying to reach my business goal or vice versa, well, you're not going to be completely aligned with it because it doesn't really match you in your business or, um, you know, but when you do have your goal that's set specifically for you and it's aligned with how you feel and what you feel you should be able to do, um, like if you want to be able to set aesthetic goals for your body, for example, I think I personally think I should be able to. Do I think I need to analyze why I need to, ha- I want to have those goals? Definitely. Do I want to have them because I feel like I should be fitting into a smaller body or do I just want my muscles to look bigger or, you know, like it's, it's, you know, it's analyzing those thoughts. But for me, positive body image has to be individual and you have to work out what it means for you because everyone's going to be different. Um, and even like me and my sister view things differently when it comes to positive body image even though we're raised in the same environment we're similar ages so we're you know exposed to similar things on social media and everything it still means different things to us both and so I think that when you find out what it really means for you you can then work towards it so much easier because you know exactly and you feel aligned with exactly where you're going 
Yeah, I love the fact that it's personalized. Mm. I love the fact that you decide what it is and that you get to, you know, dig deep and because everyone's got different belief systems, everyone's Mm. got raised up differently. So it's like, which belief do I want to override? Which belief do I want to keep? And where do I want to go to? Because like you said, if I take your goal, for example, I may not be as motivated, so I may only work out once a week. Whereas if Mm. I have my own goal, dude, I'll be like working out four times a week, right? Mm. So it just depends. Exactly. what your goal is. I remember doing the exercise of uh, my values in my life, right? And one of my biggest values mm. was health. And everyone says to me, Mahela, why do you walk every morning? Like, how do you have the time to get up and walk every morning? How do you have the time to sleep eight plus hours a day? How do you have the time to, you know, exercise four times a week, you know? And I'm like, mm. it's it's not about time. It's my value. I value it. Mm. It's my highest priority. My health yep. to me is my highest priority because I know if I have my health, I'm able to do this podcast. I know if I have my health, I'm able to show up for you. I'm able to show up for my family. I'm able to show up for my clients. I'm able to achieve my goals in my life if my health is number one. If I'm in bed and I can't move and I'm fatigued, I won't be able to do anything. So for me, that's the basis to do those things to achieve my health. So I guess you mm. would go th- through those with your individuals and ask them what their why is, find out their values, how to connect mm. it to their, you know, to their every day and stuff like that. And that's where exactly. you get the golden nugget and you achieve goals. Exactly. Because if you're, yeah, just trying to achieve a generic goal or you're told, okay, you should be working out five times a week. It's like, that's great. But if you go from zero to five, you're going to be exhausted and so sore. You're going to be miserable, <laughs> you mm. know, or, you know, whatever the case may be for your goal, you need to make sure it works for you. And you need to make sure that you are aligned with that goal, because if you are not, you are not going to want to reach it and you will sabotage yourself from reaching it. Yeah. And, you know, cause our, our brains and our wants to keep, want to keep us safe. So if you're trying to do something that's so kind of against your core values or, um, you know, against what you believe in, it's, it's not going to work. It's not going to work out. So you need to make sure that you are aligned with that. And like, for example, like if I was trying to strive towards like the full body positivity realm, it wouldn't really work for me because, you know, I kind of look at that and go, okay, well, I like to dye my hair and I like to get my eyebrows done and um, I love playing with makeup and, you know, like, and I do those things because it's like a creative outlet for me and I find it fun and enjoyable and it's self-care. But in that realm, it almost seems like for me personally, (laughs) um, and obviously everyone's going to have their different view on this, but for me, it feels like, well, if I'm trying to be like super duper body positive and not want to change anything about myself, isn't that changing things like so I shouldn't be doing that and so then that would make me feel bad about the things that I do and that I enjoy and I mean someone else might identify with being body positive and be able to do those things and feel totally comfortable and feel like that aligns for them but it doesn't feel like that for me Mm. and so if that's what I was trying to strive for I would I would self-sabotage I would not want to do it because I'd be like well but what about all of these things that I don't agree with with that so you want to make sure that you are finding something that you do agree with and that you do align with so then you don't kind of try and nitpick at things to be like oh that's why I shouldn't do that because let's be honest as humans we're pretty good procrastinators (laughs) (laughs) and even if we are aligned we'll try and find things to kind of you know take us off track a little bit but if we've got lots of things that we're not aligned with well then we're just going to be straight on a different road pretty quickly it's so, amazing that yeah. you found your little niche and it's amazing that you've figured that out you know and instead of going into that hole and feeling the shame and the guilt it's like i had mm. the shame and guilt about the body image now i've got shame and guilt about putting on makeup and all these things and it just can blow mm. up into something absolutely traumatic but when i introduced you we spoke about you not liking exercise um and you mentioned throughout the podcast that you know you're not a natural exerciser compared to your husband yeah. and other individuals so What role does exercise have in this body image? Um, And what do you do with people that just like, you know what, Brittany, I'm not going to exercise. You can do whatever you want, but I'm not exercising. But you mentioned exercise is part of being healthy. So where does all that lay? Yeah. So, yes, I definitely would say I'm not a natural exerciser. I feel like, you know, with my thyroid condition, that makes me tired and just my entire, I'm not a particularly athletic person, I would say. I'm not very well coordinated. You know, I fall over walking down a flat path. So um, I wouldn't say I'm I'm definitely not naturally in that kind of realm. Um, But how I, I feel like like exercise is a huge part of health. You can't, um, 
I feel like you can't really be fully healthy without doing some form of movement. And that's the key is that it's movement. It's not you have to be a runner or you have to go to the gym or you have to be a swimmer. Like it's finding movement that works for you. And so that's something that a lot of my clients come to me and come to my trainers because they don't like exercising and they won't do it on their own. And so they need someone to help them with it. And then they'll find, oh, actually, I really like boxing. That's great fun. Or I like doing Pilates-based moves or I actually quite enjoy going for a walk. Like, So for me, the best way to enjoy exercise is to do lots of different things because you will find people that hate certain stuff and love other things and you will find a form of movement that you do enjoy. Mm. There are so many options out there now and I think like throughout school and and everything, they're not really kind of shown. It's kind of shown as here's sport and here is the gym and athletics and they're kind of your options. And if you're not, like I, I still don't like sport. I <laughs> If like there was a group of people going, oh, let's go play a touch football game, I'd be like, no, nah, I'm good. I'll sit here with the food, okay? Like... <laughs> uh, like I still do not like it and I would not volunteer to go and play a sport because I just don't like doing it. So I'm not going to make myself do that, but I really enjoy Pilates and I like going on bush walks and, you know, I've gotten into running, even though I used to absolutely hate running, um, but I wanted to be good at it. <laughs> and that's something that does develop over time as well. But that's one of my biggest tips is find different forms of exercise and you'll find something to enjoy. And then as it ties into body image, I find that, you know, exercise and the fitness industry and body image really don't kind of go hand in hand, like traditionally. (laughs) Um, I think that, you know, the fitness industry is very aesthetically based. And so um, how I kind of take it and view it differently is I go, okay, Um, we'll take my running example again, you know, I could only run for a minute or I think I ran four minutes first and then I could run like, we like had a little break for two minutes and then I could like run one minute at a time and felt like I was going to vomit every single time. I was like, I'm sorry, we have to stop. Um, and over the course of months, like, because I'm not a natural runner, it didn't come quickly. Um, but you know, over the course of months, I've been able to, you know, I can run 10 minutes on and have a one minute break and then run 10 minutes on. And, you know, I've progressed so much from where I was. And so I can look at that and go, wow, how incredible is my body that it has done something that it doesn't naturally really want to do. It doesn't naturally, I'm not a natural runner, you know how some people are. Um, but I was able to train it to accomplish this and to get better. And that forms that appreciation for our body and like, look how incredible it is and what it can achieve when we train it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that helps, you know, having that appreciation for our body and looking at what it can do and seeing um, kind of like performance-based goals as opposed to weight-based goals can really help us um, form that positive body image and it helps to give us something that it's like, oh, cool, look at what my body can do that we may not have ever known about before that it could do that. And I just feel like that can really help us towards finding ways to be positive about our body because that's really the challenge when we're constantly negative or we're really hating our bodies we can't look at anything and go well that's good about my body but when we start to do like you know oh look I can run for a minute longer like how awesome is that that my body was able to achieve that or um, that Pilates class felt a bit easier than last time like my body's getting better how cool like like looking at it that way is is so empowering and it can Mm. really make us feel amazing about our bodies and what they can do and like I think now like just the other week I went for a walk with my husband it was just like a nice leisurely walk you know with the dogs by the water it was really lovely and and I said to him I was like you know it's really sad that people don't get to experience this because they don't like exercise but yes you know I not say all that movement. all the time yeah <laughs> you know and I'm just like this is just like a stroll for me it didn't really feel like exercise and I know that it, it would for a lot of people you know but you know getting and moving your body just just in a way that you enjoy or in a way that isn't super strenuous, you know, but you don't have to be doing insane exercise every single time Mm. and learning to just move your body and be able to enjoy that is 
is really quite revolutionary, I suppose, when you've come from someone and yeah, coming from myself from that environment of, oh my goodness, don't make me walk up that hill or why have you <laughs> parked so far away from the shopping center? You know, like, I have to mm. walk all that way now, you know, <laughs> I love that. Um, you know, like coming from that mindset to, hey, let's go for a walk and, you know, we'll just go for a 5k walk and that's like not a big deal. Like mm. it's it exciting and it's, it's exciting and, and, and it allows you to expand your mind and your body. And Definitely. if you're sitting in a positive manner, you're like, you know what? I want to do it. I'm not doing it because I have to, and I'm punishing yeah. myself for it. I want to do it because I want to do it. But yeah. yeah, I love, I love how you mentioned that. And you also mentioned the key word in there, which is empowerment. I love that because you empower yourself and you take exercise mm. as a positive thing. So yeah. With everything that you've said, which you've just amazing, amazing, amazing things you've mentioned during this podcast, what would be three practical tips uh, for the audience to incorporate to not only love their body, but also ditch the scales and and love them, love their body unconditionally? What would be some three tips? And I know you've mentioned so many throughout the podcast, <laughs> but to, to, to kind of like- to uh, condense it. <laughs> yeah, to condense it and yeah. just so the audience can go, all right, cool, action item one, action item two, action item three, and equals loving my body. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I'm big on the practical because, um, and that's what I'm all about with my my program is that, like, it's all good for someone to say, hey, love your body, but, well, how? Um, yeah. So my big tips would be um, find ways to find gratitude for your body. Um, and that's not just, like, my body gives me life. Like, let's look at a body part you don't like Let's research that body part and find positive, um, practical things about that body. Like I, in my um, program, I use the example of like your stomach, like let's research your digestive system or your reproductive system and all these things that you wouldn't have if you didn't have a stomach, you know, like, or like if you restricted yourself so extremely that it, it shrunk, like what, what effect would that have, you know? So finding practical ways to create gratitude for your body, I think is really important. And so then when you're like, oh, I'm really hating my stomach today, it's so pokey or it's really showing in this dress, then you go, oh, but like, how cool is it that, you know, I get to eat this delicious food and if I didn't have a stomach, I wouldn't be able to eat that. And, you know, I know that that might sound really basic and like, of course, like we have to have a stomach, but, you know, it just gives something positive to think about when when you're really in that negative space, it can be really hard to find anything. And so when you have done that research, you've got a little bit of something to call back on and go, okay, well, here's one thing that I can think about. And then you're like, well, of course, but you know, it's just kind of shifted you just a little bit. So that's a really good step to try and start. Um, identifying and removing that triggering media, I think is a big one. Like, um, like we spoke about, you know, you, you will probably notice now all in movies and things like that. You'll be like, oh my goodness, like look at how the different sized characters are portrayed. So it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to cut that out, but just acknowledging that um, and then replacing it with some positive media, whether that be podcasts or books or, um, you know, like Instagram, like you can follow people that are more body positive and remove anything that feels triggering to you that can really be helpful. Um, and finding movement that you enjoy would be my last one because I think that movement is so essential to our life and like it like I said doesn't have to be rigorous doesn't have to be anything because I know that like we don't like being uncomfortable <laughs> as humans and exercise is quite uncomfortable sometimes so you know finding something just like let's just gently get you in there do something low intensity if you like to dance when you were younger why not look up like a dance video um, like a dance workout video on on YouTube or something and just give it a go you know there's so much out there now that there's so many options um, do some stretching like that's a form of movement and a form of self-care that you can really embrace and it's not rigorous on your body but you will feel better for it and so as you start to do that you're like okay well what else could I feel better for and you might be like okay well I'm going to step it up to a Pilates class or do some yoga or I'm going to go for a walk and you'd be like okay that was really hard the first time but you know I felt better from doing this stretching so I'm going to you know keep up with that and then you'd be like oh well I feel better from doing that so what else could I do and you will eventually get on that journey um to go you know along there but don't feel like exercise mm. has to be horrendously strenuous because it doesn't you know mm. any form of movement is better than none 
Yeah, I love that. So we've got finding a body part that you're not really comfortable with on your body, researching the benefits and showing gratitude. Yep. That's the one. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got the two of the media, exchanging media, look, being noticing of what you're being exposed to. And then number three is find movement that you enjoy. What amazing mm. practical tips to start loving your body. And I mean, everyone can get in touch with you also if they Definitely. want to. You've got an amazing program out. You've got an amazing team of people working with you to, you know, love our bodies, which I love. I absolutely love that. But before we finish off, I wanted to ask you, what is a as I ask all my guests, what is like a natural health hack that you do every single day, once a week that just changes things? And you do that like daily, you might do it monthly, yearly. What's that one thing that you think changes, um, helps you achieve your goals? For me, I would say foam rolling would be a big one. Um, It's basically a form of self-massage. For those who don't know, you kind of have a long cylinder of foam and you kind of move your body around on it and it kind of massages you. But um, I found that like from doing all different forms of exercise and especially when I started running, I was quite conscious about, um, you know, avoiding injury and things like that. And through foam rolling, it has, you know, been able to maintain that, um, you know, not getting injured, not letting your muscles get too tight. I just find it's like such a relief. I find it so relaxing. Um, So I try and do that a few times a week. And um, I've also like all my clients that start with me, I'm always like, do you have a foam roller? Have you ever done foam rolling before? <laughs> um, and almost like usually in the first month that we'll, um, if they don't have one, I'll bring mine along and I'll be like, I'm going to teach you how to foam roll. And at the end of it, they're just like, that was amazing. Or they might be like, that was really painful. And I'm like, yeah, but you just need to keep doing it and then it will get less painful, but you'll feel so much better for it afterwards. And I find it's a really great way if you can't kind of get massages all the time to really maintain that looseness mm. of your muscles. And like, I I do go get massages and stuff but um you know every time they're like oh you know your shins are really good for um you know help for your running and things like that so like it really helps with your body so that would definitely be my my thing that I do all the time that I really really notice a difference with foam rolling I love that I haven't had someone say that one before so no I love oh, that <laughs> foam rolling absolutely amazing thank you so much Brittany I mean you've shared some absolutely amazing information on this podcast how we are able to ditch the scales and start loving our body. I want to put in the show notes notes where individuals will be able to reach you and also a link to your website and your course. Um, Absolutely love, love, love the information that you shared with us. Is there anything else that you want to share with the audience before we close off for today? Um, Yeah, just that you can find me over on Instagram mostly is where you'll be able to get in touch with me. It's just at actively you underscore. Um, And yeah, I do have a full masterclass out as well, which goes into a little bit... um, a little bit extras as to what we've talked about today and some of the things we've discussed as well, top tips to enjoy exercise as well as um, loving your body and ditching the scales. So I've got a masterclass that's fully free as well on that as well that they can access. And it has a cheeky little uh, discount code for my program as well. So there you go. People jump, (laughs) jump on that. Not only is it so much filled with information, but it's also free for you. So you can see that Brittany's put her time aside to ensure that you start loving your body, which I absolutely love. Love. Thank you so much for joining us on Natural Health Podcast, Brittany. Um, and remember, the missing link between failure and success is your health. The content and information provided here is the opinion of Mahela Raguz and is for information purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. It is not intended to provide medical advice or take the place of medical advice or any current treatment you're undertaking. Consult your own medical professionals for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to the Natural Health Podcast. It is advised that you consult your doctor or healthcare professional in relation to any health concerns you may be having. Mahela Raguz does not take responsibility for any health consequences which occur from a person listening, viewing, or reading this content. And in the circumstances shall the Natural Health Podcast, Mahela Raguz, any guests or contributors to the Natural Health Podcast, or any employees, associates, or affiliates of Mahela Raguz be responsible for damages arising from the information provided on the Natural Health Podcast. By listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice to treat any medical conditions in either yourself or others. Please note if you're taking prescription, do not stop your medication or start a new protocol, including but not limited to supplements, diet, lifestyle changes without consulting a doctor or healthcare professional. If you or any person has a medical concern, you should consult with your healthcare provider or seek 
seek other professional medical advice. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something that you have read or heard on the Natural Podcast or in any linked materials. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor or emergency services immediately. Neither Mahayla Raguz nor the publisher of this context takes responsibility for the possible health consequences of any person or persons reading or listening or following the information in the educational content.